As we have repeatedly seen, the Great War was one of attrition, and so we've covered a number of obsolete rifles and pistols dragged into the front lines as supplies dwindled. Italy's first repeating rifle, as old as it was, would be no exception. Hi, I'm Othias, and this barely fits in frame because it's one of the longest rifles we are going to see in this show. It's also one of the oldest because this is the Italian Vetterli Vitali Modello 1870-87. Let's uh, see if we can get this down in the light box. With an overall length just barely exceeding 53 inches and a weight of 9.7 pounds, this is a very large rifle. It has a magazine capacity of four rounds of 10.4 millimeter. Now this rifle is absolutely an antique. The one I'm holding in my hands today was actually manufactured in 1881, which means that it pre-existed that 1887 designation in its name. And so that means I'm going to have to talk about the first variation of this gun, which I do not have a example of here. It's actually quite rare because almost all of them became this gun. But that would be the model 1870. And that gun is just about as old as, well, the Kingdom of Italy itself because it really came in right at the end of Italian unification. Recall that the Italian peninsula wasn't a single kingdom until around 1871. That date, however, is more or less the end of unification. The process had begun as early as 1815 and took decades and plenty of blood and sweat to accomplish. So as we roll into the 1860s, the Italian government is really becoming pretty concrete, and the Kingdom of Italy is definitely a thing, it's just not done settling itself into the entirety of the peninsula. But it has a military, and it's an armed military. Unfortunately, it's ad hoc. All the little fiefdoms, I mean, this is very delicate, and I am not a big Italian historian, just like I'm not really an anything historian other than the wide and general view of firearms. So. I'm going to very shallowly comment on this, and then I expect you guys to do your own research if you'd really like to know how Italy turned from a loose association of cultural identities into the kingdom that it was until it was no longer a kingdom. So, just know, it was mostly the kingdom of Italy in the 1860s, and it needed to fight just a little bit longer to get the rest of the way there. And as part of that, everybody was carrying around, well, mostly muzzle loaders. And the problem with that is we are now into the breech loading era and that is going to be a big critical phase for armies that don't want to get left behind. By example, in 1866 the Austro-Prussian War was won decisively by the Dreiser needle rifle, severely outperforming those Austrian muzzle-loading Lorenzes. We've discussed this before as it drove the French to adopt the Chasse and then later that would evolve into the Gras, which we've seen in another episode. Now much of what was the Kingdom of Italy was taken by force at the right time with the right people and the right weapons. And so when you see the rest of the world going for something like the Dreiser needle rifle and you've got muzzle loaders and you're already kind of the small guy on the block, well, you do not want to get left behind. And so Italy would start really experimenting with, you know, rear loading their guns. And as part of that, they actually picked up a number of conversion processes. And one in particular does kind of stand out, and we've actually mentioned it before. That would be the Carcano. This conversion for a muzzle loader would later be adapted and married to a Monlicker magazine and merged with some Schlegel milk bolt work to form the Carcano 1891. Again, another episode we've already done. But of course, that would be much later. For the moment, these conversions from Carcano are better than a muzzle-loading rifle, but still not truly modern. And that's because the new big thing wasn't just breech-loading, but also metallic cartridges. Up until this point, paper cartridges were sort of the king. Now we know when an army wants a new gun, it's time to start the trials. And at first, they'll survey everything they get their hands on. I mean, just anything that looks good will explore. And then at a certain point, it sort of coagulates into a, a smaller number of three, five, maybe even up to ten if it's a really careful army. But you get down to a smaller list of guns. And these are the guns that you start actually trialing, as in making a hundred, two hundred of them, and handing them out to troops, and getting them dirty, and beat up, and forcing ammo, and overcharges. 
that kind of thing. So the big three focus that it would whittle down to in the first rollout, well, those things are going to be a little unique because they're not always this kind of guns that we've been seeing from other armies. They would be trialed beginning in May of 1869 by four infantry regiments and, and five Bersaglieri battalions. The rifles included this Burton 1868, a rifle known as the Valdoco. And by the way, I will point out that these two are stocked very much alike at this point. And if you saw the gun I held up earlier, I think this stocking is going to have a strong influence on the direction of the final rifle. But as we know with our future telling glasses, there's one more rifle to consider, and that is this guy, a brand new design, who was developed in Switzerland by one Johann Friedrich Wetterli. Born in 1822 in Wagenhausen Thurgau, Johann Friedrich would apprentice as a gunsmith following his basic schooling. From there, he traveled to Lar and Paris and Saint-Étienne and then London, becoming familiar with as many modern firearms production practices as possible. He would focus on breech-loading firearms while working in London, and there he received an offer from back in Switzerland to become a weapons department manager of the then somewhat new Schweizerische Industrie Gesellschaft, and I'm sorry I probably brutalized that, but you might know it as SIG. Now, I do not have an original as adopted Swiss Vetterli. Those things came out all the way back in like 1867. And I'm not going to go into the whole evolution of why which components were chosen, because that's a story for the Swiss Vetterli. We should talk about it when we get the opportunity in the future. But for the moment, I will say that you do have to vaguely be aware of the Darling. And this particular one's a lot later. This is actually a 7881, so uh, not really the gun that influenced the later... Uh, you know, Italian Vetterli 1870, but it incorporates a lot of the same features and a few redundancies that were taken off. Uh, I think it's good enough for a quick look. But before we do that, I will say, as you see this, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen these around, they're pretty common in the collector's market and they're well known online, but uh, you might not know the first version of this was a hammer fire. You see, that protrusion of the firing pin was actually originally for the hammer to fall on. This system was probably because this is what troops and the military were used to at the time. Hammer fire rifles. Now, hammer fire was not something the Italians really considered. They looked at a gun much like this one. I think we can tell that by the results here. Although, I am going to set this aside. I'm sorry, there's a, not a lot of room and there's a lot of rifle. And we're going to hold up this Swiss. Again, this is a later model. I want you to ignore the sights. There's going to be possibility of gate covers and things like that. Basically, the Swiss Vetterli got updated every five years or less. There's so many variations of this gun, and it's actually really worth looking into if you want to collect a million of something. But, again, not our topic for today. I just want to get into a couple of quick details. So, let's take a closer look at this gun. Okay, touchdown. Let me make sure we're in frame. And there you have it. We have a very familiar looking bolt action system, very modern in the sense that we understand it. On this particular gun, it has a magazine, tubular magazine and elevator. If I yank back hard enough, we will pop that up. It's gonna feed the next round. As we come forward, it's gonna drop back down. This whole magazine system has no bearing on our gun today. So while I pointed out to you, you can go back to safely ignoring all this. What we care about is all this action up here basically this bolt. Now this thing is very advanced. Uh, on this particular gun, it is rimfire, so I'm gonna check close. And then, I hate doing this with a rimfire special rifle, but I really wanna show you guys something, so I'm gonna go ahead and let that pop. So, she's fired. Our striker's all the way forward. I want you to see this because this, as early as it was, is a cock on open bolt. You see that guy coming back? And it has a cocking indicator, we can see that that striker is all the way to the rear. Beautiful. As we pull the bolt back, we're gonna see another fantastic feature. Let me get my patented plastic pokey. We have locking lugs. One and two, uh, up under there, it's hard to see for you guys. Two locking lugs, symmetrical locking lugs. That is a big deal this early in history. Now, uh, other parts of this gun include the fact that, like I said, it is a rim fire gun. You can see there's uh, two prongs on the bolt to go ahead and hit for rim fire, or you can take my word on it. And uh, we've got a cross key here that retains the bolt, so if we get her halfway back and punch this out, it's going to release the bolt. We'll see more of that when we get into the Italian one. And again, there's no appreciable safety, although you see some features like this trigger guard with this uh, 
hook for your finger instead of a semi-pistol grip stock. This actually comes from the fact that it's probably easier to add this onto this forged piece here than it is to get the grain in the right direction to make a semi-pistol grip stock, semi-pistol grip stock, excuse me, and then actually get the pistol grip done and leave all that strength there. And this is stronger than it anyway. So the idea here is that you can still pull into the shoulder like you would with a semi-pistol grip stock. Probably not the most ideal spot compared to an actual stock, but hey, that's why that finger rest is there. We've actually seen something similar to this on a revolver very recently. All right, so oh, let me get this guy back. That's just the very basics of the Vetterly system. I don't wanna to go too crazy from there because I wanna show you some more when we actually get into the Italian gun. Now, before we do that, we gotta to go to trial. So this is one of three guns in the trial. And just to point something else out, disregarding the guns it was up against, this gun, well, not this particular one, but the Swiss Vetterly system predates all of the following. The Austrian Vrundel of 1867, the Russian Berdan II of 1868, the German Mauser 1871, and the French Gras of 1874. Most of these are bolt actions, unlike the Vrundel, and all of those bolt actions in this case lock off of one side, the, basically the root of the bolt handle unlike the Vetterli, which has two beautiful locking lugs. Now, as cool as this is, it does not mean that the Italians just immediately jumped up and bit on this gun. They were being cautious, and they tried out some more rifles in extended means. So you're gonna see things from like Wesley Richards and Remington, and even another design submitted by Carcano, and then I believe they tested the Verndel just because Austria-Hungary is right there. Uh, they considered a lot of different guns. And there was one that was even actually really unique, a domestic design. The Pieri Trials Rifle actually used a thumb pad behind the bolt instead of a trigger. There was no trigger. With competition like that, I think I understand who's gonna win this. But uh, while all that's cooking, as a matter of fact, before most of it was cooking, it seems very early in the trials, Italy had a handle on what they wanted. And that was a very specific 10.4 millimeter cartridge. And it may have also been inspired by the sort of 41 Swiss. You see, their cartridge was fairly good, but it was a little short and it was rimfire, like I mentioned before. This is not always a completely reliable system, which is why it had two heads to the striker to really make sure there was detonation. But the Italians, well, they're adopting a new gun and they want to leverage the very best in ammo technology. Their new round would be the 10.4 millimeter center fire cartridge. This was often referred to as 10.35 or 10.4 at various times. It's all the same cartridge. Big, somewhat slow and hard hitting, it was right at home with other ammunition of the day. The center fire bit, however, was a big improvement. Originally in black powder, this cartridge would actually stay in service long enough to see an 1890 upgrade to smokeless ballastite. Thankfully, the over-engineered Vetterly action could handle the change in pressure. So basically this gun, with a center fire cartridge, maybe a little longer length. That sounds pretty good. Uh, one oddity though, the Italians had no interest in this magazine system. And because of that, they actually decided to have no interest in a magazine system at all. They were not going to adopt a repeating rifle. It would be a single shot veterly action. And I know that seems odd, and maybe not very forward thinking, but it's not unrealistic at the time. You see, Italy had some concerns about the Swiss magazine. We've already talked in this show about how tubular magazines change the balance of the rifle as you fire them. And the Italians found this tube system with the gate really slow to load and kind of clumsy. They found it especially hard to do while prone. You guys can argue it all you want with me, I'm not the Italians, they didn't like it prone. And they also had that usual fear of wasted ammunition. Now, just to refresh, that concern of wasting ammo, the idea that why would you give a soldier the ability to fire so fast that he's no longer aiming, that's not unrealistic for the time. Not just that it's not uncommon, it's not unrealistic. Because remember, uh, one of the big things about World War I that caught people off guard was the ability that everybody was sort of resupplying by rail so rapidly because supply used to be the big thing that held up armies and kept campaigns tight because you couldn't move everything around at every front at once. You had to pack it in by foot or hoof. And we've previously said that the Italians had specialty units just because they were short on horses in battle. That's why they had hyper-mobile, fast-marching, lightly-armed 
troops, okay? So Italy is not about to bank on a system that requires more supply mobility than they have. And then, additionally, on top of all that, it wasn't really recorded in the books, but I suspect that it's also a cost savings feature. Magazines are complicated and expensive to produce, and the Kingdom of Italy was not a major juggernaut at this time. So, in the end, they adopted the Vetterli, and they placed it with the single-shot stocks that we saw in those other rifles, and then, boom, we've got the Modelo 1870. This gun, by the way, was officially adopted in August of 1871. Now, there would be a number of minor modifications before this cemented into the production model you see here. Even after that, there would be changes to, say, the rear sight and safety over the years. But much of that is another story for another day. We're just going to hit the highlights in this particular episode because we're on our way to another model. I will, however, point out that this first single loader had a very noticeable dust cover over the action. And that's unique only to the single shot, and it also forms some of the shape of the receiver and features that we're going to see later on. Now, pay attention to that date, adopted in 1871, all right? No one else is really fielding repeaters. It's basically the Swiss, and then there's some countries that have bought commercial Winchesters or other things like that. And, uh, I mean, we see a lot of experiments with the repeaters in the U.S. during the U.S. Civil War, but... Nobody has, in big European terms has gone totally over to a repeater other than one neutral nation. So it's not that weird that we're down to a single shot, just like I said. There's all these considerations for Italy, but then there's also not a lot of pressure to do otherwise. Until we see our good old friend, the Siege of Plevna. This was, again, a battle between the Ottoman Empire and the Russians. And the Ottomans used a combination of single-shot Peabody rifles and multi-shot Winchester 1866s to resist a much larger Russian force for an unbelievable amount of time, and it made a lot of the news for military officials. Everybody was watching, and soon discovered that it's not a bad idea to have a military rifle with a magazine in reserve to be used only when there's a breakthrough or a cavalry charge. Yeah, that devastation at Plevna really sold this concept. And so, even Italy had to stop and go, oh boy, we probably should have put a magazine on that thing. And so, they start fishing around, and they're not exactly fast at it. It's going to take almost a decade for this to really settle in. And to be fair, they need to be careful, because just like I said, they don't have money to burn. They want a rugged, reliable, and inexpensive, easy system. And luckily, one inventor would happen to be there in Italy to pick their brain. Giuseppe Vitali was born in Bergamo in 1845 and served in the Austro-Prussian War in 1866. Well, the Italian parts anyway. A member of the artillery, he had plenty of chances to practice his technical expertise and would rise to the rank of captain in 1878. In 1883, he would be assigned to the Turin Arms Factory with the rank of major. It was in this role that Vitali would begin to influence the Italian Vetterli rifle. His first distinction was reforming the safety. You see, the original Italian 1870 had no safety, but this quickly gave way to a simple trigger block, kind of like on an SVT-40 actually. But that too did not last very long, and instead it went almost immediately to, well, more of a manual decocker. The Claverino safety was a thumb pad on the right side of the receiver. Pressing it forward depressed the sear. As you close the bolt on top of the safety, it would return that decocker back to its original position, while camming surfaces inside the bolt gently lowered the striker. Obviously, this leaves a firing pin against a live primer, and it is easily subject to accidental discharge. Yeah, I'm going to imagine there were a fair number of incidents with that particular safety. I mean, strike the butt on the ground too hard and you have a risk of blammo. Uh, smack that pin around a little bit too much, maybe blammo. It, I don't know why you would leave a firing pin on a primer. It's, ugh. okay, so, that safety needed to go. And it needed to go inexpensively and with minimal adjustment. And so, in steps our hero, Mr. Vitali, in 1884 with his own unique safety. Now, that safety would stay with the gun for the rest of its service life. So, even though we haven't yet gotten to this magazine, I can at least show you what I'm talking about with that. So, let's get in. And you see, there's a swoopy doop right there. All right. I have to... I can't apply this with the bolt close. I have to open the action. So, I could feed around, imagine it's a single shot, feed around, 
and then throw the safety and then bolt forward. This is really the only way to sort of set it up. So you would bolt forward and then as I brought that bolt in, that swoop holds the root of the bolt handle so that it cannot close all the way. At the same time, when we had pressed this forward, it had actually sort of disengaged the sear. You can see the trigger moving because of it. So if I bring this guy back open, uh, let's just watch it again. Watch the trigger. See? So now there's nothing holding the striker back right here. See that cocking indicator? So if I close this, watch the striker. It's hard to do and give you the room. See how it drops? But unlike the previous uh, Claverino, this safety, the Vitali safety, uh, does not let the handle all the way down, and therefore this striker cannot get far enough forward to touch the primer. It's being held by the camming surface inside the bolt. So uh, it's just lowering with the bolt and rising with the bolt. If you want to recharge the weapon, if you want to make it ready, you do not have to retract it all the way. You just pump her all the way up. And when you pop her all the way up, this guy who is sitting over tipping point when the handle touched down on him will snap back to position, free up our sear, and when we put our bolt back down, boom. So just in case there's any confusion on this, because I know that was a lot of steps, I would, in theory, if I want to use the safety, I could put it on first or throw the round in first, that part doesn't matter. Loose round, safety up, bolt forward, drop down, safety is on, cannot fire. We're disengaged and that pin's resting most of the way forward, but not enough to touch the primer. And then when I'm ready to fire, I would just up, down, and boom, she's ready to go. All right, so Vitali has already started making adjustments to the service rifle, one without a magazine. Imagine that that's not there. Uh, I should probably say there obviously wasn't just a rifle. Uh, there were carbines and other things like that. I don't want to get into big detail though. That again is better served by an episode very specifically tailored to the Vetterly 1870 itself, a gun that really wasn't used in the Great War, only this version later on. Getting back to repeaters, the Italian Navy would actually be the first to adopt one because of their separate procurement process. This is the Vetterli Bertoldo, and it used a tubular magazine system, kind of like the Kropacek. But of course, this would not satisfy the Army. They already said they didn't want a tubular magazine. Now, the Navy may have adopted their gun in 82, but the Army had actually been thinking about this more seriously since at least 1880. They were actively testing a lot of systems, including, by the way, tube magazines, even though they didn't want one, tubes in the buttstock, weird capsule mags almost, and rotary things. They tried a lot of stuff. But remember, they want it simple and effective. So, uh, probably at least 12 designs were submitted by our good friend Vitali. Uh, he really wanted to fly everything he could past the officials, and he was adapting everything in sight. Now, there may have been more than 12, but I know there was at least 12, because it's his 12th that they actually ended up settling on finally, a four round box magazine. Using a simple metal box that fit four cartridges, single stack and powered by a simple flat spring and being capable of being fixed to the rifle with minimum adaptation of the stock and action itself, the Vitali box magazine was the winner. It also had the added advantage of using a charger, allowing for rapid loading in a time when the Monlicker clip had just been developed. This was another chance for Italy to take the lead. A little over 1,000 rifles were converted to the new Vitali magazine for testing in 1886, and with minor changes they would emerge in 1887 as the new official rifle. Now the magazine wouldn't be the only change to these rifles, but it certainly was the most prominent. All right, we made it to our gun today, and that means that we can actually get a closer look and see what all little changes were made to this gun from the 1870s. So let's zoom in. All right, now I know I didn't have an 1870 to show you, so this looks like the gun you already saw, but I wanna point out a couple things. Uh, number one, there's now a magazine. It looks detachable, it is not. It's actually held in place along with this reinforcing plate that was designed to make sure that we didn't weaken the stock when we bored it out for this big magazine. I mean, that's a big hole that you've opened up in a gun that wasn't supposed to have a hole there. So this reinforces everything on the other side. It goes right over the original trigger guard at the front here, bolts right through, held on nice and tight. Gun looks good, all right? Uh, by the way, this takes up the minimal amount of space because it's been shaped around the shape of the potential cartridges loaded in there and tipped. So it comes out with a very odd 
sort of swoop and everything, but it's good because it's less likely to snag and less likely to beat up on your soldiers than having a bunch of empty space in there that's not really being used. All right, we still have our trigger spur that came all the way over from the Swiss. And if we look, we've got our updated safety that I already talked about. And back here, this rail, this rail was actually not on the original 1870. So on those guns, you would pull it back and the whole way back, the bolt would be unsupported. And you can tell there's a lot of play in that bolt. That wasn't a big deal when you would bolt open, put a round in the opening, and then guide the bolt back in. The problem happens when you load a magazine of four rounds and you want to be able to, from the shoulder, go boom, boom, boom. And you can still see, even with the rail, I'm getting some snag. So the rail, I'm sorry, I'm making a lot of noise. The rail is very necessary. It's not even super perfect smooth with the rail. Without it entirely, you're going to be jerking the bolt. It's going to be walking in sideways. You're going to be grinding stuff because it's no longer the calm, even flow. It's rapid fire. So uh, let's get a closer look again. There we go. Uh, rail, the dust cover is gone. It's been removed because it really wasn't doing much for the gun anyway. And now it's just going to get in the way of loading the magazine and confusing people and causing jams, especially if you leave the dust cover off and try to bolt. So imagine if you had the dust cover closed, you fire one, you rack it back, it doesn't eject. And then it starts to pick up, you get a binding, it's a horrible mess, just cut the dang thing off. But they kept a tab back here to serve two purposes. So if I open this up and we look down inside, uh, it's a little dark. Let me see if I can get you just enough light. You wanna look just in front of the bolt face, right in here. This has a magazine cut off, see that? So with that in place, we can't really load any and we can't let any pop back up. It holds them right down in the magazine well and we can single load this rifle until we need to, boop, use the magazine. So that's your cutoff. Secondary function of this is it's actually holding the cross key. So you have to align this, have the bolt halfway out and then you can push on the other end of the cross key, pop and pull and that frees the bolt to come out of the action. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, while we're looking down in the magazine, I wanna point out there's two interrupters here because it was a rimmed cartridge. As a matter of fact, I have one round here that's a hand load of ours, but look at that big prominent rim. Uh, if you want to be able to feed this without rim lock, you're going to need a spring interrupter that's gonna hold the second round well below the first, the next one to come up. Uh, so that's what those guys are for. They let everything pop and go. They also just keep the cartridges down in there. Now, uh, you may have seen I have a charger. So this would have been loaded with four rounds and the whole thing is inserted into the magazine, uh, of course, without the cutoff engaged. So the whole thing is inserted down in the, yeah, okay, I'm clear. It's hard to do without actual ammo on the thing. The whole thing will go down in there and then once you're in, by the way, there's an arrow marking which way to orient it. Uh, it would actually be sort of held in by the pressure of the cartridges on top of those springs. You would grab this rope and yank it back out and toss it away. You'd have four cartridges sitting down in there, an actual charging charger. Uh, pretty good design, honestly. I mean, it seems kind of ratty, but I mean, a lot of countries had no loading systems. Most of them were still in tube loading format. The fact that the Italian army was really resisting going to a tube loader and instead went with something like this, very, very advanced thinking. All right, uh, while I'm here, I just wanna point out something else. You may see some notches here. Uh, that's where two long springs have been set. They form these interrupting springs here. So these heads go all the way down the outside. There's a relief cut here, a relief cut here in order to get that all set up and then they're screwed in. That's gonna be important on our next episode actually. Now, uh, while I'm still at the gun, I will point out there's a small little drain hole here so it doesn't fill up with water. And then, oh, we need to look at the sights for just a second. These are actually the 1890 sights. They have been updated for use with the smokeless cartridge. Before that, they would have had a uh, similar but more Carcano looking veggie sight. Uh, as a matter of fact, this came out for the 1890 ammo, and then when the Carcano came out, they almost went right back to a very similar sight to what had been previously on the gun. Uh, if you're just curious about the overall gun, two barrel bands, a big old cleaning rod, and a side mount bayonet lug. More on that a little bit later. Ugh. So, there's our rifle. The next bit we gotta talk about is just the bolt itself. So, we have an overhead extractor, and then this finger right here 
this protrusion, that was actually added. There's no feature like that on the original bolt because it was a single loader. You didn't really need to control the cartridge as you fed from the magazine. This is a rim support. It does a beautiful job of helping the gun pick up, move, and direct the cartridges into the chamber. Now, I do want to take this bolt apart for you guys because it is absolutely fascinating how modern it can truly be and how simple it really is despite the complicated shapes. Okay, really simple operation here. I can simply unscrew the back of this guy. It's gonna be under spring pressure, don't be alarmed, and don't be caught off guard or you'll hit the cat in the eye. I'm still unscrewing. There's a lot of unscrewing here. Boom. They didn't want these coming loose at the wrong time. Caps off, spring is out, cover is out. This is a sealed action. I mean. When you think of like Mausers and Monlickers, most of that caulking surface is actually exposed to the elements. This is sealed up, very good design. And then our striker comes out, beautiful. And then this is probably the most interesting feature. Our bolt handle comes out and the locking logs here are attached, see them very clearly, attach the bolt handle, not the bolt body. Now this makes, the fact that they has two symmetrical locking logs, that is incredibly, good for the time. That is a very strong system for 1870, uh, or even early because, you know, 1860s for the Swiss. This is brilliant. And then cock on open, by the way. So let me look again. There's your camming surfaces on the backside. So basically when this guy's home, then he just, see that twisting force? The twisting force pulls him back and cocks the action. Awesome, awesome design for the time. The only problem is it's on this collar. And because it's on this collar, it's actually a little weaker than it could be. If it had been put on the bolt body, well, this would be modern strength. Because while these are shallow lugs, they are very wide. Uh, they have a taper to them that's a little unnecessary. But these are good locking lugs. There's a lot of theoretical locking strength here. But it's on a collar, not on the bolt itself. So there's ever so slightly, mind you, it's very finely fitted, but there's ever so slightly chance of a sort of lateral play to it and to get pounded on by the force of the shot, which means you get some nice cracking that can go into this action if you don't have the ammo just right for it. It's just, it could have been so much stronger if this part was milled onto this part. All right, other than that, we have our extractor that sits over top. I'm not gonna pry him out. There's no real point to doing it. And then the bolt face, yada, yada. I think the rest of this makes sense. Uh, the ejector groove is here and that matches just a simple screw head that is down in the action. Way back in that little corner, you should see the head of a little screw. That's all that's really kicking out the cartridge at the end of its travel. All right, normally I would, I made a mess. Normally I would kick, ooh, like a, there we go. Okay, normally I would kick this right over to an animation, but I just wanna make sure that I cover that this is not the only version of this gun. It's just the one we have here today because they did do a couple carbines. So the long rifle is called the Fucile Modelo 1870-87, just an infantry rifle. There would also be a Moschetto da Truppe Speciale, that's the specialty troops carbine. More on that back in our old Carcano episode. That's just for guys who don't need a rifle. Now, the cavalry carbines were not as a rule converted. However, some, very few, intended for colonial use were, making these very rare. Those are the Moschetto da Cavalleria Colonial. I don't speak Italian. All right, so that has us caught up enough that I could probably put this guy back together while you look at one of Bruno's animations. First, we'll load this gun up from a four round charger. Here is the magazine cutoff, set in place of the old dust cover. With it on, we have a single shot rifle. Flip it over and we feed from the magazine. Here, note the locking collar, which is actually one piece with the bolt handle and locking logs wrapped around the bolt body, a separate component. The striker is reset rearward when we open the bolt. It's cammed back by the diagonal surfaces at the rear of the locking collar. Here we have the safety which disengages the sear and essentially allows the gun to decock. Although, unlike the earlier Claverino, 
This one blocks the bolt handle so it can't quite go into battery. This keeps the firing pin off a potentially live primer. Alright, I think you have it from here. So now let's get this over to May. I, uh, I'm not going to lie, this is probably the most fantasy, steampunk, fictional looking rifle that we are going to do for World War One. If you showed me all these other guns that I already know of, and then I went like 30 years with never seeing one of these, and you just pulled it out of some cabinet somewhere, it was the only one in existence, I would think it was made up. I mean, it's just... Look at these lines, these curves. I mean, it looks like grandma's favorite lamp more than it looks like a rifle. And it's heavy and long and just plain kind of cool. I was impressed to actually get to shoot this on range alongside of May. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite oddities. But uh, fortunately, kind of common in the U.S. Uh, it's not the rarest gun on the block. So if you see one, maybe give it a thought. But that aside... It's time to get back to some history because I still haven't said who made these or how or what. So let me just point out that originally within the first year, two years, three years of production, you're going to see three government arsenals. Uh, Fabrica Nazionale d'Armi. I can't speak Italian. These three guys. There's one in Brescia. There was one in Torino. And there's one in Torre Annunziata. A fourth would actually be set up in 1884. That's Terni. That's about the time of the new safety, actually. Now, it appears records are a bit hazy, and uh, survey is kind of hard because there were serial blocks assigned to different manufacturers, and then they rolled through them kind of... There's hiccups, like there always are. But uh, historians seem to place about 1.6 million of these guns in production by the time it was halted with the adoption of, as we know, the Carcano. So that makes it a very significant rifle. This was fielded very widely by the Italians, and it was a real part of their sort of identity as an emerging kingdom of that time. Now, uh, I will say we haven't done any accessory work, and there were plenty of variant bayonets for this rifle and its carbines. I don't really want to go into the weeds because it's just not good entertainment, and by the time we get to World War I, we're only talking about one particular model. But if you don't care about you know doing a lot of reading i would really really recommend the book that is linked below because up until it was released i had very little data on how the italians did anything with these guns it wasn't a big name gun out there and go click the link the book is new and available now if you're watching this anytime in the next couple of years it is out there and affordable and i know there's so many of these guns around you should just buy it. Support the people who do the research instead of just the bearded guy who repeats it. All right, anyway, back to the bayonet. Generally, you're going to see this sword-type 20.5-inch blade. Minor variations in spring attachment, etc. exist, 
but that's all we really need for the moment. So with all the invention and production out of the way, let's talk about action, because these guns had a very long service life. Most iconically, they were fielded in the Italian colonial campaigns in Africa, including their invasions of Eritrea, Somaliland, and, less successfully, Ethiopia. Despite the introduction of the Carcano, Vetterli also made a show at the Boxer Rebellion. Well, that was about the time that these guns were edged out almost entirely by the new smokeless powder 6.5mm Carcano. And so, they started moving into the surplus commercial market, which makes for an interesting side story. The Irish Ulster Volunteer Force was a paramilitary organization that stood against home rule at the turn of the century. Part of their mission included gathering small arms, which wasn't really something the Crown was super happy with. So they started smuggling them in. As part of this, at least 5,000 Vetterli Vitali were purchased along with 1 million rounds of ammunition. While they served to arm the UVF, they were not very popular and were nicknamed gas pipes. Most of them would be surrendered to the British authorities at the start of World War I, although some went on to drill use and fewer still ended up in the hands of, ironically, Irish Republicans during the Easter Rising. So the Vetterli Vitali, up until that point, was really just being used to encourage Africans, and uh, it was used for drill by some Irish people who preferred British people. That's not much of a military history, I'm afraid, and it'd be sort of the last of this gun as it finally fell out of favor. I mean, we're into the 19-teens. The Carcano itself was from 1891. They really should be considering a replacement for that. Not that they really did, but we're behind. We're like two guns behind the present day, and so that should really wind this gun down into a slow retirement, if not for the fact that war were declared. That's right, and as we've said so many times before, it was a war of attrition. Wear the other guy out until he runs out of beans, bullets, and even black powder rifles. So, uh, this Vetterli Vitali was going to remain in service for the Italians a little bit longer. And like I said a bit earlier, this gun, well, they had produced 1.6 million, and according to Italian inventory, uh, about 1.3 million were still available in working condition. Now, a lot of those may have been in the colonies where they were serving in place of the Carcano. That's kind of good because we'd prefer to have the Carcano back at home. And that meant that Italy had a lot of emergency go-to rifles, and even though they were no longer producing the ammunition, they had plenty in storage. So, good call, easy to draft up. Now, mind you, these 10.4 millimeters were kept far from the front. They were rear echelon and guard duty work, because we would much rather our front line all have that same 6.5mm cartridge firing out of, well, hopefully a Carcano mainline rifle. Honestly, ammo was the big limiting factor on this going up to the front line. Uh, the Vetterli Vitali and its 10.4mm cartridge, there's just a logistical nightmare to move that stuff up. And then you'd also have to produce it, and you don't really want to produce two types of ammo. You could. In that what you would be producing for 10.4 could be producing 6.5. That goes in our machine guns and our rifles and both. We're going to produce that, all right? So this is held back for now. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the Vetterli still had something of a frontline role, just not the Vetterli Vitali. I'll talk to you guys next episode about a different rifle that I'm sure many of you are familiar with already. Now, that means it's kind of weird that I'm having this conversation because it seems like Realistically, the Italian Vetterli in 10.4 sounds a lot like when we did the French adoption of a rolling block, which they just used for guard duty, right? Like, this thing's sitting with rail guards and bridge guards and stuff at best. So why the whole episode on it? Well, the interesting thing is that Italy, of course, is not the only nation desperate for rifles. There's one nation above all others who will take any bang-bang rod and subsequent ammo they can find. And that nation, as you all know from watching this show, is Russia. We've seen them buy up Gra, Kropacheks, Arisaka, Bertier, Winchesters, and now we're going to see that they take up the Vetterli Vitali. Like so many other Russian emergency rifles, these would come courtesy of the British, whose attaché in Italy in September of 1915 reported back that 500,000 of the guns could be made available almost immediately. Now here's the catch. 
no ammo was offered in that initial opening conversation. It was going to have to get produced elsewhere. Although, with some finagling, the Italians did agree to free up 8 million cartridges to possibly go with those rifles. So, this whole thing was rolled into a bundle and sent over to the British, not the guns, the offer, uh, in a letter. And the British military attaché included, and I'm not kidding, this particular language. The Vetterly rifle is bad, but better than a stick. And on that note, the British War Cabinet approved the purchase of up to 300,000 rifles and the 8 million available rounds of ammunition. All of it to be passed to Russia. Now, Russia is... I mean, they need rifles. And, of course, they're allied to the British and French who want them to have the rifles. It goes a bit beyond that as to why everybody was in such a rush to get everything possible into Russian hands, including something like this. And really what it was is Romania. Uh, Romania had been lured into the fight and was now getting summarily stomped in the head. Please watch The Great War if you'd like to see some of this. We talked about some of it in our Romanian Rifles episode. But poor little Romania was supposed to have Russia's backing and Russia was so short on equipment that it was a very easy excuse to not get involved as well as they should have over on the Romanian front of things. And so Russia would constantly say, look, we can get over there and help Romania. We can commit, you know, 250,000 men or 300,000 men or whatever, but we have no rifles for them. Find us that many rifles and subsequent ammo. And so, yeah, that's why. This was a bid to put soldiers on the ground in defense of that eastern front. And so, that's going to make the math seem a little bit odd if you've already done the numbers on guns versus cartridges. 8 million cartridges, 300,000 rifles. Just over 26 rounds a pop. That is not going to sustain an offensive. Even as a reserve weapon, that's not so good. So contracts in Italy and the US would be let out for some 300 million more rounds, making them serviceable rifles. The first batch of rifles would be shipped out in November 1915, and by January of 1916, all of the rifles and 14 million rounds were delivered. Not too shabby. Subsequent orders and deliveries would result in Roughly 400,000 of these ending up in Russia, along with 31 million cartridges delivered. Now, of course, the total, like I said, was 300 million. 100 million of that was coming from the U.S. and 200 million from Italian producers. So, okay, uh, one problem, though. Russia runs out of money, and then they sort of run out of government, and then they run out of the fight. And that leaves a lot of people holding... Well, a lot of work. As a matter of fact, the American company that had been contracted for 100 million cartridges, they had only delivered a small portion of that before it was told, eh, don't worry about it. But they had already leveraged all these assets, and so they were forced into liquidation. Awesome. There's so many stories of unpaid Russian debt in the U.S. over this conflict. Well, when, governments when governments collapse, they tend not to pay their bills. But anyway, the other unusual part about this is that lots of ammo was left undelivered on the docks in France. That's right, the great majority of finished ammunition never made it to Russia. And eventually, the French wanted that space back in their dockyards. And so, they said, get it out of here, it's garbage. And so, 300,000 rounds were returned to the Italian Navy, and another 20 million were set aside for the Siberian Expeditionary Force, just in case. Still, even with that plucking, 80 million or so rounds were destroyed by the British. They were just recycled into raw material. That is a huge waste, unfortunately. Now, uh, the deliveries of these guns and others did give Russia enough room to commit 250,000 more men to that sort of Romanian front. That did not really do anybody any favors, though, as it came a little little and a little late. Uh, while we're talking about Romania, though, I want to point out that it turns out that maybe the Russians or maybe somebody else handed over a fair number of these to them as well. Now, I have it on good authority that Romania records an inventory of at least 122,000 of these guns received by November of 1917. I'm unsure about how much ammo they received, though. These were much-needed rifles, as Romania was desperate for arms. Remind me to show you a terrible revolver some other day. So, some of the Russian stock was used by the Russians, some of it was taken up by 
actually internal forces that were neither red nor white when the Civil War broke out, and some of them ended up in the hands of Romanians. And then, as things calmed down, the Soviet Union decided that they wanted to support the Republicans decades later during the Spanish Civil War, and so actually a number of these guys would be shipped from Russian inventory over to Spain. And so, uh, while it's true that some of these guns have turned up with little Russian proof marks here and there, uh, look carefully for Cyrillic, it doesn't seem like it was universally applied at acceptance. It seems like sometimes they stuck around long enough to get some sort of inventory mark. It, it's not a big you know, Russian ownership stamp. But there's a good chance that if you have a Spanish flaming bomb on your stock, that your rifle came via Russia at some point. It's also worth mentioning that the Ulster Volunteers had tried to purchase these a little more directly earlier from a dealer in Hamburg. That had been uh, cancelled by the British and the guns were returned back to Germany. And that means when war broke out for Germany, there were 20, 30,000 or more of these in sort of the surplus market and they were drawn up by the German army for drill. Nothing else. That's not even really used as a guard rifle. But hey, there were some in Germany. Now, uh, other uses of this gun after World War I would include, well, a bunch were sold to Chinese warlords, and actually more interestingly, a number turned up in the hands of Turkish nationalists. Now, at that time, this is immediately after uh, World War I, this is the Turkish War of Independence, at that time, the Russians sort of favored the Turks, and the Italians sort of favored the Turks. The Italians just really wanted to tick off the Greeks. Uh, it's kind of weird. It's really weird to think of the Italians and the Russians getting along with the Turks. But it, one of them gave them these. We don't know if it was Italy, we don't know if it was Russia, but they were smuggled over there and they should not be. Oh, and speaking of smuggling, the ones that were sent to Chinese warlords out of Italy, there was also an embargo on that. And so they shipped them in crates marked Japanese toys. And it worked. I feel like inspection maybe didn't do their job there. Anyway, finally, the guns continue to serve all the way into the 1940s in places like Ethiopia, where they had either been bought in on the surplus market or captured straight off the Italians. Matter of fact, Ethiopia had uh, started running out of sort of supply ammo that they had had left over from fighting with Italy for the 10.4, so they had to contract with a French company to produce new 10.4 because they had enough of these floating around through the 30s and on into the 40s. So this is a gun that went from 1870 to at least like 1941, and maybe even a little bit longer than that. That is really, really fascinating. All right, but I'm starting to wander a bit further off track because we are a World War I show, and so let's bring it back around and just briefly mention the last little bits of our inventor Vitaly. He hadn't just developed the safety and magazine systems, Vitaly also took an active role in improving the manufacturing workflow for this rifle, organizing private contractors for small parts and streamlining assembly. In 1891 he would leave Turin and through various assignments rise to the rank of lieutenant colonel. Vitaly would continue to serve until he retired from active service in 1903. In the reserves, he rose to Major General and then would be recalled during the Great War, where he served as an inspector for the artillery and rose to Lieutenant General. He would pass away in 1921. I should also add here that his magazine system for adaptation to a single-shot rifle would actually be used again, this time with the Dutch. So that wraps us up for the Vitali part of the Vetterli Vitali. There's more Vetterli, however, to come. But before we get there, I think it's fair to wrap things up for today and go ahead and let May in here to give us her opinions on this very unique firearm. All right, once more, we've made room for May and have just barely enough studio space for this particular uh, rod. So let me get that over to your hands. We're here to talk about the 10.4 millimeter Italian Vetterli, probably the oldest shoulder arm we are going to see uh, dredged up for World War I. This is an 1870 design, as we've covered, with some modification in 1887 to get it into a whopping four rounds, still better than a Bertier. So, let's get May's opinion, starting with, as always, your first impressions on your hand of the gun, you got a shoulder of the gun, we're not quite firing it, what are these ergonomics like? So guys, not counting the Tiga Vera, because that thing was on a bipod, this is the longest, heaviest gun I have shouldered to date. Take it a second to get it all in frame for you there. 
Um, yeah, it's super awkward. I am really grateful there's only four rounds that I'm having to shoot out of this guy. Because after the fourth round, you definitely need to put it down. So this isn't something you take out and have fun with all day long. No, this is just for shoots and giggles. <laughs> Off and on throughout the day. But anyway, yeah, so the length and weight definitely don't add to this guy. Um, they definitely detract. And the balance point on this one is so far forward that it just kind of makes it awkward to handle for, you know, handle it all on your shoulder, which that we're going to get into that in the shooting a little bit more. Um, the action, you know, it kind of reminds me of Elite Enfield, a clunkier, gunkier, not nearly a smooth version of it, but it, it kind of does in just that it feels like there definitely are steps to the maneuverability of the action, like one, two, three, four, five. Like I really feel like you could get great fast training with these guys if you try. Um, I will say this action, it's very rough in that I feel like I could easily just push it even just a little bit and it would not want to function. So good on the boys for adding in a guide rail back here because that really does come in handy. Like I can't imagine maneuvering this one comfortably without that. It definitely adds to the gun. Um, straight wrist stock, not my favorite, but hey, they added a trigger spur. It barely really kind of helps in this situation, guys, because if anything, I just have one extra finger pulling this back into my shoulder. It adds a little bit, but not enough in my opinion. So it's better than not being there, but still not the best at all. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was, so you guys, some of y'all have given me a little bit of crap about wrapping, not wrapping my thumb over the stock for this gun, with guns in general for the show. In a situation like this, definitely you can see where it's not going to be a good thing because wrapping my thumb over, I really don't have a good per- I really don't- I'm not able to put my hand far enough forward in the, my opinion. And my thumb and forefinger are being squished by this guardrail back here. It's not comfortable. You have to grip into a part of a screw that's sticking out. Like it is- there's nothing about this that makes sense for you to wrap your thumb over. So wrapping to the side, and in general, for a lot of these old guns, it just makes sense to do that. So if you haven't tried it, honestly, just give it a shot at this point. You may be surprised at how well it works for you. But yeah, ergonomics, this is a long, weird, clunky gun that has a lot of little little bits to it that kind of make it awkward. All right, so May's a bit bitter, and I can understand. We get a ton of comments. Actually, uh, I tend to clip some of our comments because we get about four sexist comments per hour as it is. And when I say sexist, I don't mean, you know, minor commentary on this and that. I mean, usually we have profanity filters that you wouldn't believe at this point. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, the wrist, to the, the thumb to the side thing, that's just been a constant complaint on some of the more shallow videos. And then, you know, everybody's always said, well, why didn't she wrap around? Why didn't she wrap around? And I've said repeatedly, it depends certain slide actions, certain actions with external action, uh, certain with external hammers. Um, mm -hmm. Even things like, a, like for me, I don't know about you, you're much smaller than I am, but like a Moss 36, I can't put my thumb behind on a Moss 36 bolt action because if I do with that short shoulder, I will just bop myself in the nose every time it fires. I have to put my thumb to the side. So at some point, you want to know enough oddities that you just kind of get used to putting your thumb on the side of the gun the first time you fire a new gun because you don't want to punch yourself in the nose or have some piece of metal catch you or whatever else. And then that just becomes your habit when you're dealing with old guns over and over and over again. Now, if you have one that you love that you get to shoot all the time, uh, yeah, put your get the control, do whatever you want to do. The problem is I don't know the last time I shot the same gun three times in a row within a month, two months, ever, because we're constantly doing stuff like this for the show. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we covered ergonomics. Uh, I will agree with her, even at my size, this is a very awkward rifle. I mean, this is like, this is muzzle loader territory, especially in terms of that forward weight, that, that balance point way out here beyond the shoulder. It's really like, if I just sort of let everything relax, you can see it wants to tip up and out of my shoulder. That's not super great. That's not where we really want to be. And you can control it with a single finger down here, but even with my hands, I can get a thumb over. It's still, I mean, look at how much I've stretched out my hand to do all this. It's very uncomfortable. The trigger feels pretty far forward for where this grip is. There's nothing holding your pinkies and stuff. Semi-pistol grip would be better, I agree with you. And then the Lee Enfield thing, I agree actually, and May's the one that pointed out to me, it is very familiar because this straight but turn, not turned down, but the straight but downward 
bolt handle, very similar to the later Lee's, and then puts you right over with the trigger. That much is actually really nice. So, oh, good, my left arm is sore just from doing that. Yeah. So, uh, here, let me hand this back over to you. Uh, let's talk about sort of loading and firing this gun, because that's where it gets fairly unique, where we have, like, actual charges and things like that. What were your impressions of, well, here, those little guys? Yeah, so loading with the charger, surprisingly smooth. Except for the first time we tried to load it on range, the 100-year-old rope actually snapped on us, so we had to go get some twine in order to continue with the shoot that day. Aside from that, though, it was a surprisingly smooth system. It didn't jam on us once. It loaded all of the cartridges. So, nice surprise that the charger fit in there, and it's it's pretty obvious how far down you need to shove it, too. It, it, it has a positive stop on it, which is nice. So, yeah, kudos on them for the... For the charger on that one, it, it works surprisingly well. Oh, uh, not to interrupt, but one thing, don't forget 1887, this is dropping about the same time that the Mon Liquor clip is. So that puts the Italians right on top of innovation. In a weird way, on an old gun, mix of old and new, the old Italian way, right? So mm -hmm. at least ammo loading wise, they were doing something right for just a brief moment in time. But I'm sorry, let me get back to what you were doing. He's so rude. He can't help himself, guys. Seriously, this guy. Huh. Who does he think he is? Some sort of star of a channel or something like that? Sure. Anyway, so while we're talking about the gun, uh, before we get to the actual shooting part, I want to make sure I mention some little bits and biddles on this guy that are awkward to operate. So the magazine cutoff, it works. It works very well. It's a little bit awkward in that you have to thumb down the round and then turn the magazine cutoff to the side. A little bit awkward, but it worked. It was very positive, it worked very well. It's very obvious when it's on or off, so there's no mistaking that there. Um, the safety, another weird thing to operate because you have to open the bolt in order to flip the safety on. And there, it's on, it works. It's, it's a very positive safety. But the problem is I then have to open the bolts again in order to you know make sure the safety is off. So those two things, not my favorite. They work, but why do they need to be that overly complicated? Why can't they be a little more simplified? Anyway, um, shooting sights on this gun. They are tall. They are actually surprisingly tall, but they remind me of old revolver sights, the steeple sights. So they're a little more rounded than what I would expect. That being said, at least they're tall, so they're easier to see. They're just, they're not the best they could be, but they're also not the worst they could be. So I guess you can give the sights kind of a middle of a ground uh, uh, view, review on that one. Uh, the shooting part, the trigger on this guy, it is very heavy. It's a very heavy single stage trigger and not smooth at all. It's kind of creaky. You can kind of feel it. It almost feels like a 100 something year old rifle. Go figure. But it, it's super creaky all the way through. And then I didn't anticipate when the break was going to happen, which was nice, but it's still not my favorite trigger, but at least it was nice and heavy and you really didn't know when the break was going to happen. Um, the recoil on this gun, barely noticeable. I mean, there was recoil, don't get me wrong, but it's such a heavy gun to begin with. The cartridge isn't the strongest it could be, but it's, you know, I definitely didn't really notice a lot of excessive recoil in my opinion. So I feel like you could probably shoot this all day if you wanted to and not really come away with a bruise or anything like that. Um, but yeah, shooting it, it was fun for a few shots and for a few giggles, but it wasn't exactly my favorite and you know this balance point all the way far forward and the weight of it really kind of wears on you as the day goes on so not a not a long day shooter but it shot all right i have to agree with all those points may i take that another thing i'll point out actually just because you did a good job of covering everything um, thank you it's oh lovely go on on the sights, uh, you might notice this is, I think, the first time you lost paper on the target. Oh, not lost paper, but lost uh, silhouette on the target. It's true. So um, part of that is because this gun, at a minimum, was set for 275 meters. So we should have taken a 6 o'clock hold right from the start, and we did not. We took right for the A. Is that correct? Yeah. So she shot a little high. And then in addition to that, these sights are actually bent. And I can sit here and try to bend them back. And they're probably just going to get bent again because I'm looking at their sort of overreach beyond the sort of 
reinforcement of this spring, t this line of, I don't even know what to call this component. It's like a <laughs> spring and support rail. But right there at the screw line for that is the last bit of sort of auxiliary reinforcement for the sights. And then they stretch out for almost three quarters of an inch beyond that. And then they stick up. So the problem is they have been whacked pretty often right on that point and they bent back a bit. So I find these sights to be a strong weakness in this gun if you want a very accurate range setting on your sights. And also 275 is, that's a lot of range. I don't know. Yeah, we didn't have that much range when we were shooting this guy, so. Yeah, so uh, anyway, not the cleanest battle sights. Uh, being a quadrant style, it's got like, a, you know, these big risers, almost like the Longa Vizier for the Germans. A little bit of a sight in, uh, uh, peripheral vision eater. But it's really negligible though that it's it's there's barely in on that one. I don't know what it is about those sites in particular, but I don't feel like they were blocking me out that much. Yes, it's still there, but it really was barely noticeable in my opinion. Okay, cool. So this is your first time off the silhouette, so I'm very sorry. This must be very disappointing for you. It was uh, gonna happen someday. Does that mean that you are going to tell us a different than usual answer for this particular gun when I ask you, are you okay? taking something like that into the Great War? So I have a lot of respect for this gun at its time. Like the action was very solid for when it was originally made. When it was used though in the war, I feel like its time had passed. I had a lot better, safer options to choose from. This really isn't the best. I mean, there's a lot of fiddly bits that go with it. It's like Othias is pointing out, the sights were already damaged on this gun when we got it. I feel like by that time, I wouldn't be comfortable taking this into battle because we have one. I, I wasn't able to get all my shots on target. That already makes me nervous, but I do know it was due to the crooked sights. But also, it just feels finicky. Like, I feel like any sort of modern muck getting in here really isn't going to help with this gun. It already need is, needs this guy rail in the back to really stabilize it. Ugh, there's just too many negatives with it. I feel like I can survive with much better options. So do I think I could defend myself if I had it? Yes, I would certainly try. But do I feel like if I got the split second jump on a guy where he's got a gun as well, do I feel like I'm going to be confident with it? No, I really don't. So in this in this situation, I'm going to have to give this gun a pass. I am going to have to agree with May because I want to approve this gun I, personally. And I tend to like to think a little bit more like I'm issuing it to 100,000 people. They're 17 years old. We just pulled them into the war. May I borrow that? Mm -hmm. So the problem with this gun is you want to love it because it's so truly modern. And yet it looks like a complete antique. I mean, it's amazing. This is probably like an ornate muzzle loading looking gun. It's massively long, massively heavy. These odd ramp sights that go out for like seven inches because it's been adapted to smokeless powder and just had everything constantly changed. It's wild, okay? At its heart, it is an 1870, I mean, even early than that, 1867 really, bolt action rifle, symmetrical locking lugs at the rear, uh, turned, not even turned down, straight angle bolt handle that drops you off right at the trigger just like a Lee Enfield. And then in 1887, it was fitted with a four round vertical magazine like we've covered, which loaded from a charger. And by the way, I consider this a charger. I consider, not to give too much away, I consider this to be an end block clip. And then I consider a stripper clip to be a stripper clip. Uh, I know in different languages and at different times, some, especially end block and charger are interchangeable. I kind of like the idea of separating charger from end block, even though very few guns use this system. It just, to me, this looks like a charger. That's just an aside. It has a charger loading system in 1887. Now, around that time, revolutionary was the end block coming off a of Monlicker, right? So it's already completely up to date on loading the magazine as best as it can be short of having the other system. And by the way, the charger system doesn't leave that opening at the bottom. It's it's a good system, I like it. I mean, it's really close to a stripper clip. And that was considered amazing when Mauser did that. So how bad can this be? Now, 1887, there's a problem in that smokeless is hitting, the French have the Labelle, but even in the Labelle, the revolutionary rifle that changes the world, it's using a tube loader, and this is a vertical magazine with a charger. So it's got something over this first smokeless rifles. That's that's a lot. That says a lot for how advanced this gun was internally. The problem I have is when you get to the Great War, number one, yes, all these features are dated. And yes, it's reaching the limits of its locking strength. But more importantly, when you're trying to issue this to conscripts, 
there's too many things to remember. Like, you have to, first of all, easily damage. We talked about that. But then second, like, you want to use the safety. So that means you got to open this up and then flick it forward and then push it down. And by the way, that doesn't seem like too much to remember until you recall, do I want to have a live round in there or not? So when I go to do that, which ammo is where? And then once it's here, it's okay, well, you just rebolt it and that's fine. Although half the ones I've seen because of their age, and I can't tell if Mud at the time would have done the same thing, you bolt up and it doesn't snap back mm -hmm. because it's just gummy. Yeah. And so you just bolt up and bolt back down in the safety. So I don't know if that would happen at the time or not, but it just seems like another thing that you got to keep an eye on. Yeah, I would literally be sucking checking that if I were using it. No right. Question. And by the way, effectively, this safety is just an, an out-of-battery lock. Like, it just locks it from going into battery and a bit of a decocker. And the one before this was just a decocker, which is just weird all over again. So you got to know that. You have to know which position the magazine cutoff really means what. And when you look down in there, when it turns, it's not very clear that it's on like it's about a, a quarter inch of metal that you have to be aware is there so you might start trying to load and just be like what is what i mean i actually did that at one point when we were yeah, testing I forgot you just did do that. banging on it going what the heck's how that's why these lips down here are bent over i gotta bend them back out because i sat there and by the way you do that you bend these lips over and then it's even harder to then properly load it and yank it back out so there's just all these things that need to be done in the right order in the right way make it too finicky for Let's get these half-literate teenagers in here so they can start shooting at each other. It's the hokey-pokey version of the gun. Um, yeah, turn yourself around and maybe not take this into battle. But that doesn't mean we don't love it, and it doesn't mean that it's not underappreciated. We think the Vetterly is a fantastic piece of military history. Just don't really want to get in a fight with one. So I think that'll wrap us up unless you have anything more to say about this beautiful, uh, let's say, Victorian accessory. Now, really, honestly, this was just a unique piece of history. I'm glad I got to handle one. But to be honest, I feel like we've gone over everything. I wish that they had stronger sights. I wish the action was a little bit better. There's a lot of wishes in this gun, but none of my wishes are going to come true at this time. So for now, I think we'll just say goodbye for the evening. Yep, I think that'll wrap us up. Uh, stay after the credits for any updates. And thank you again for watching. Thanks, everybody. All right, gang, time for the update. Now, if you don't follow us on Facebook or uh, over at Patreon, then you might have missed out on a bit of drama over the past couple weeks, which is that we repeatedly get messages that ask us to participate in the current political dialogue. Unfortunately, we are a history show, and while I have very deep-rooted personal feelings about the current state of American politics, about half our audience doesn't actually live in the United States, so I'm not really sure who I'm supposed to be yelling at, and while I may have my opinions, I am not the sort of person who has the time to put in the research to be an adequate spokesperson for anything other than exactly what you see on the show. And so I am bowing completely out of this political conversation and don't really want to make comments about lawmaking. I will say right now there will be an exception because if anything happens that would actually stop us from producing the show or make it unsustainably difficult to make the show, I will have a duty to tell you because... I won't be able to do the show. I will just say, hey, look, this is coming up. It may stop the show. I'm very sorry if it stops the show. I won't tell you how to vote or how to feel about it. It's just a heads up. Other than that, you guys are all adults. You all make your own decisions. And you all have the option to seek out political content where it is. And I do not say this as any disparagement towards people who do produce political opinion shows on firearms or anything else. If that's your thing and people want to sign up for it, that's great. All right, the rest of you can just enjoy Oasis right here and only see history and occasionally Mark's profanity. We thank you all for your support, and if you really want to make sure that we can stay sort of unaligned, then I highly recommend visiting us over at Patreon, because that means no matter what the platform or the risk, we have the means to support the show all on our own with you guys' actual financial support. All right, thanks.